Welcome to Jesus or Muhammad. We've got a special episode for you this evening. This is a Cold Case Files episode of Jesus or Muhammad. If you don't know what Cold Case Files are, that's when police uh, know that a crime has been committed. They investigate the crime, but after uh, a long period of time, perhaps years of investigating the crime, they just can't solve it. And so they have to sort of set that aside and it goes down as a cold case. The trail has run cold. But after a period of many years, maybe someone can reopen the case when new evidence is discovered and then find out exactly what happened. The crime that was committed that we're going to be investigating this evening is the murder of Muhammad. Lots of uh, Muslims don't know that Muhammad was murdered. It's in the sources, whether you're Sunni or, or Shia, uh, you should believe that Muhammad was actually murdered. But if you open many modern books, it will simply say, Muhammad was in his 60s, he got sick one day and died, and that's all that you hear. Uh, but there's more to it than that. Um, if you go to Shia scholars, many of them will tell you that Muhammad was poisoned, not by his enemies, not by the Christians, not by the Jews, but by some of his closest companions and even his wives. They'll tell you that Aisha poisoned <laughs> Muhammad. Uh, after being influenced by her father, Abu Bakr, to murder Muhammad in order to seize power. Uh, this is what Shia scholars will tell you. Uh, the um, Sunni Muslim scholars will paint a very different story based on Sunni traditions, uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, and so on. Uh, they will tell us that Muhammad was poisoned by a Jewish woman who was very angry at Muhammad, for uh, some of the things that he had done to Jews and who also wanted to test him to see whether he is really a prophet. If he's really a prophet, he won't die. Uh, he won't eat the poison. So this is the Sunni explanation. So Muhammad is poisoned, then after a period of a couple years, that poison had, had eaten away at him, had uh, messed up his internal organs, and eventually he dies from the poisoning. And according to uh, Sunni sources such as Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, towards the end of Muhammad's life, his followers actually had to carry him around while his feet were dragging on the ground because he was so weak from the impact of this poison. Now, that's uh, a dispute between Sunnis and Shias, but non-Muslims are interested in this topic for a somewhat different reason. We want to know, is there any evidence that Muhammad was a prophet of God? And so we're interested to see what kind of evidence might be out there. And I'll give you an example of what I mean right here. Uh, suppose I argue with you along these lines. Suppose I say right now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a prophet. And if I'm not a prophet, may God strike me down right now. I'm still here, so I must be a prophet, right? If a prophet comes to you arguing that way, chances are he's a false prophet, because real prophets don't usually need to argue that way. Uh, so if I were to say to you Muslims out there, I declare that Muhammad is a false prophet. If I'm telling you something wrong, may God strike me down. Oh, God didn't strike me down. I didn't get hit with lightning. Therefore, I must be telling you the truth when I say that Muhammad is a false prophet. Pretty bad argument, isn't it? So this is one way you can spot someone who's probably not telling you the truth when they start arguing along these lines. Now, Sam, did Muhammad ever argue this way? Did he tell his followers... Uh, may God strike me down or something along those lines to as, as some kind of evidence that he's a prophet? Yes, actually, uh, you'll find at least two places in the Quran. And by the way, uh, good to be with you tonight, David, and good to be with you, our brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. I pray in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit will seal you for all eternity and keep you in love with Jesus Christ. And I pray that for David and myself. Thank and again, you. we beg the Lord Jesus, our God, to be magnified through everything we say tonight. Protect us from error grant us clarity of thought and speech, and to be a blessing to you, his people, and to convict Muslims so that they can see the truth of who Muhammad was and the truth of who Jesus still is and will forever be in Jesus' name. So I just want to ask the Lord to bless us out of his grace and mercy. There are at least two places in the Quran in which Muhammad makes a similar argument to the one that you made. Chapter 10, verse 15 of the Quran, <coughs> Surah al Yunus, chapter 10, verse 15, <coughs> says this, And when our signs are recited to them, clear signs, or verses in this context, those who look not to encounter us say, bring a Quran other than this or change it. Say, now here, the author or authors of the Quran are com commanding Muhammad to say the following. It is not for me, this is what Muhammad is supposed to say, and which he did. It is not for me to change it of my own accord. 
I follow nothing except what is revealed to me. Truly, I fear if I should rebel against my Lord, the chastisement of a dreadful day. So if I were to change it or play with Revelation, I fear that I will be greatly ch chastised on a dreadful day. There's another one that's more relevant to your cold, cold case, uh, case file. <laughs> Chapter 69 of the Quran, verses 44 to 47. Chapter 69, verses 44 to 47. Here's what Muhammad is supposedly commanded to say. If he dare tamper with the so-called revelation. Now again, for the record, none of us believe the Quran is revelation from the true God. The only book that is inspired by the true and living God is the Holy Bible, which God has preserved in His providence. Be that as it may, nonetheless, here's what Muhammad is reported to have said in chapter 69, verses 44 to 47. And if he, Muhammad, had forged a false saying concerning us, we surely should have seized him by his right hand, and then certainly should have cut off his aorta, or life artery. Let me repeat that statement again and then sh certainly should have cut off we would have cut off his life artery aorta and none of you could withhold us from punishing him 69 verses 44 to 47 so yeah. muhammad actually gives an argument to his followers if i were telling you false things about god god would kill me but obviously i'm not dead so god hasn't killed me so i must be telling you the truth this is the 7th century version of God will strike me with lightning if I'm lying to you. God will strike me with lightning if I'm leading you astray. Uh, so we'll lay that aside for the moment, but keep that in mind that we have in the Quran, in the Quran, we, we don't, as Sam pointed out, we don't believe this is revelation, but you Muslims out there, you believe in the Quran and you have in the Quran, Allah saying that if Muhammad is telling falsehoods, if he's saying false things about Allah, Allah will sever his aorta. The aorta is the artery that comes out of the top of the heart right here. Allah is going to sever it if Muhammad is deceiving people. Interesting stuff. But let's move on to our cold case file. We'll come back to this later. How did Muhammad die? Again, if you open uh, Muslim sources, um, modern books, lots of times you'll just see that Muhammad got sick one day and died. Um, our brother um, C.L., Yes, sir. Uh, from a Muslim background, so you spent about a decade as a Muslim. This is correct. What do you hear? What do you hear just in the Muslim community about the death of Muhammad? Well, you know, when you are introduced to Islam and Dawah, Islamic propagation is given to you, this is not one of the topics that's brung up. You know, they don't give you a whole lot of detail. Um, when I first became a Muslim and I start reading the Sirah of Muhammad and his biography, you know, basically the short end of the story was that Muhammad, he lived his life, he completed his mission. Towards the end of his life, he, a sickness overcame him, you know, a sickness all of a sudden overcame him and he died and he passed away and his, follow, his followers mourned him. So, uh, you know, there, was, there wasn't much detail about, you know, why he got sick, how he got sick, and none, of, none of these things. Uh, what you see inside the Hadith collection and what is written in more detail by the prophets, I mean, not the prophets, but the scholars, this is not information that's given to the average everyday Muslim. And we're going to see why this information isn't given to the average everyday Muslim. First of all, um, CL, just give us the basic outline of the story of Muhammad getting poisoned. What happened there? Well, from the Sunni sources, uh, what you have is that the uh, Muhammad and his followers, his, his Sahaba, they conquered a group of people. They went into the city and they conquered these people. After they conquered these people, a Jewish woman came and gave him a gift. People were giving him gifts. The gift she came and brought him was mutton or, you know, cooked lamb. So he gladly accepted this as a gift from her. Him and his companions, they sat down and they ate. And according to the Islamic sources that I read, that the the food actually communicated to him. The, the food gave him revelation, and the revelation was that I am poison. So he immediately stopped eating this food, and he went on from that point, and he lived another four years, and this was almost given as proof that he is a prophet because, look, he ate poison, and he did not die. Well, that's, uh, that's some interesting stuff. Sam, uh, what kind of sources do we have? 
Is this, is this just wild speculation? Are, are these Christian sources or Jewish sources or really weak Muslim sources? What kind of sources do we have uh, on this story? And could you read a couple for us? Oh, yeah, I have several. Uh, so where do you want me to begin? There's too uh, many. Start have, with the uh, most reliable you have. Okay, we have several from Bukhari and Muslim. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> let me read this. Um, let me see. Sahil Bukhari, Volume 3. So let me give the reference so that those who want to go and read this for themselves and investigate on their own. Sahil Bukhari. Volume 3, Book 47, Number 786, Number 786. <clears throat> this is the Hilali Khan translation of Sahil Bukhari, which is available in nine volumes, and online for free. Uh, narrated Anas bin Malik, a Jewess, Jewess brought a poison cooked sheep for the Prophet who ate from it. She was brought to the Prophet and he was asked, shall we kill her? He said, no. Then notice this part. I continue to see the effect of the poison on the palate of the mouth of Allah's apostle. He's talking about the effects that resulted in his death. Let me read another one Hold from on. Bukhari. So just to clarify, mm -hmm. uh, Muhammad at least ate some of this poison. Yes, he did. And we, from Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, Muhammad did consume some of the poison and it had an effect on him. And this passage that you just read said he continued to the see effects. the effects of that poison on the palate of Muhammad. So apparently it discolored his palate or disfigured it somehow inside his mouth so that when Muhammad opened his mouth you could see the effects of this poison. Must have been some powerful stuff. Yes. Go ahead. In fact, uh, Muhammad himself attributed the poison to his death, that he died as a result of the poison. Here is the other reference to further confirm and substantiate uh, that assertion. Sal Bukhari again. Sal Bukhari, Volume 5, Book 59, Number 713. Volume 5, Number 713. Narrated Ibn Abbas. And he replied, uh, that indicated the death of Allah's apostle. He's claiming that when chapter 110 was quote-unquote revealed, that indicated that Muhammad's death was imminent. So he goes on to say, Umar said, I do not understand of it except what you understand. Whatever Ibn Abbas said about the compilation of this chapter, he accepts. Narrated Aisha, the prophet in his ailment in which he died, the ailment that resulted in his death, used to say, oh Aisha, I still feel the pain Caused by the food I ate at Khaybar. And at this time, I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. This is a very strange claim. Muhammad is the first person in all of history I've ever heard of who died complaining that he could feel his aorta being severed. Now, why is this relevant? Does anyone think of why this might be relevant, that Muhammad died screaming about feeling his aorta being severed? Precisely, yeah. Uh, Where did we hear that before? Mm, was that in chapter 69 of the Quran? I don't know. Let me, let me go back and, and read this one more time. In fact, I'll give you four translations. Sam already read one. I'll give you four translations of Surah 69, 44 through 46. Remember, Muhammad dies from poison complaining about feeling his aorta being cut. Now, isn't that a weird claim? Have you ever heard anyone saying, oh, I feel my aorta being severed? No, I've never heard that. That's a very strange claim to make. Let's go back. I'm going to read you four translations of Quran 69, 40 through 44 through 46. And if he had invented false sayings concerning us, we assuredly had taken him by the right hand and then severed his life artery. The life artery, that's the aorta. Uh, Hilali Khan, Sam already read. And if Muhammad had forged a false saying concerning us, if Muhammad had forged a false saying about God, we surely should have seized him by his right hand and then certainly have cut off his life artery and in parentheses, aorta. Wow. Daoud, had he invented life concerning us, we would have seized him by the right hand and severed his heart's vein. And Shakir, and if he had fabricated against us some of the sayings, we would certainly have seized him by his right hand. Then we would certainly have cut off his aorta. Think about this. The one person that you've ever heard of, the one person that I've ever heard of who died complaining about feeling his aorta being cut is the one person who says, if I'm deceiving people, God's going to cut my aorta. Right. Hmm. Is that a coincidence? Now, as Sam pointed out, we don't believe that this is revelation, but we do believe that God has the power and the ability to disgrace someone who's leading people astray. And if Muhammad is walking around claiming to be speaking on behalf of God and isn't, we wouldn't put it past God to do exactly what Muhammad said was going to happen to him if he's leading people astray. So my friends, 
Notice what we quoted to you. We quoted, one, the Quran, and two, hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari, your most trusted collection of ahadith, the most reliable, authoritative source on the life of Muhammad for Muslims around the world. And you have, one, Muhammad claiming, if I'm a false prophet, God's going to cut my order. And then a few years later, Muhammad dying saying, my aorta, my aorta. Is that a coincidence? Leave that to you. But Sam, we have more sources on this. What else do we have? Sure. I, well, I want to read one that actually relates to a companion of Muhammad who actually died. Wait, there's more? There's more to this story? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's interesting, a, interesting. Muhammad's companion also, unfortunately, partook, partook of the poison, and he died. So I think this is interesting because you're going to see he actually realized there was poison in it, but continued to eat it nonetheless. This comes from Ibn Sa'd's uh, Kitab al-Tabaqat <clears throat> al-Kabir. Uh, Kitab al-Tabaqat al-Kabir, which in English is the Book of Major Classes, Volume 2, pages 251, 252. Unfortunately, glory to God, these sources have been translated in English. So you can get actually an English translation of this very source. You find it online and you can read it for yourselves. Let me just read. It's a lengthy quote. I won't quote all of it for the sake of time, but the salient points. Here goes. When the Apostle of Allah conquered Khaybar, and he had peace of mind, Zainab bin, uh, bin al-Harith, oh, the brother of Marhab, who was the spouse of Salam ibn Mikshan, uh, inquired, Mishkam, which part of the goat is liked by Muhammad? Which part of the goat is liked by Muhammad? They said the foreleg. Then she slaughtered one from her goats and roasted it. Then she wanted a poison which could not fail. The Apostle of Allah took the foreleg, a piece of which he put into his mouth. His companion, Bishr, notice this. Bishr took another bone and put it into his mouth. When the Apostle of Allah ate one morsel of it, Bishr ate his. Now notice Bishr is imitating Muhammad. He sees his prophet eating, so he eats. And other people also ate from it. And after all, it would be bad etiquette to eat before your prophet. So he's waiting. Then the Apostle of Allah said, hold back your hands, because this foreleg supposedly tells me it's poison, right? Thereupon Bishr said, notice this, Dave, by, whom, by him who has made you great, I discovered it from the morsel I took. I realized this was poison. I guess he could tell by the taste. Something wrong with this morsel. By the way, he's not a messenger of Allah. He's not a messenger of God, but he could tell just by tasting it, it's poison. So much for the food having to tell Muhammad it's poison. Right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, nothing prevented me from emitting it out. When I knew it was poison, nothing stopped me from spitting out but the idea that I did not like to make your food unrelishing. When you had eaten what was in your mouth, I did not like to save my life after yours. So if you're going to die, then I'll die with you. I also thought, now here's the relevant point, uh, part. I also thought, you would not have eaten it if there was something wrong. Being a prophet, I thought, man, you wouldn't eat it if it was poisonous. But he did eat. Therefore, Bishr went ahead and ate after him. What happened to Bishr? Bishr did not rise from his seat, but his color changed to that of, uh, it says, uh, a green cloth, and he died. So Sam, Sam, he was putting his trust in Muhammad. Precisely, and it resulted in his death. CL, CL, now, now we, Sam pointed out that Bishr is trying to follow the example of Muhammad. Is that important in Islam? Well, yes, that is one of the bases of Islam. You know, Islam has two revelations, two sources the Qur'an, which everyone knows about, but you also have the Sunnah. The Sunnah is the actions, the approvals of Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> um, so whatever Muhammad tells you to do, or he forbids you to do, or whatever you see Muhammad doing as a good Muslim, to follow his Sunnah, the second source of revelation, you have to follow in like kind. This is very important. This is a part of your salvation. A uh, Muslim scholar from the time of the Salaf, he said that Islam is the Sunnah and the Sunnah is Islam. Mm -hmm. You cannot have Islam without the Sunnah. You have to follow the Prophet, well, Prophet uh, Muhammad of Islam. Now, that strikes me very odd that this man, he was following this man who he believed to be a prophet. He ate the morsel and he trusted that, hey, if there's something wrong with this, Muhammad's going to know before Precisely, me. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. going to get the revelation. Yeah. So Which let me get this yeah. straight. Trusting Muhammad can get you killed. Exactly. And I don't mean killed as a martyr. I mean, if you trust in Muhammad and you follow and try to please him, you might die from doing that. Is that right? In yeah. fact, uh, Dave, uh, 
Uh, people need to know why she would poison him. I think. I yes, don't know. yes, I'm concerned. Muhammad was so why, why nice am? and kind to everyone. Precisely, yes, he was such yeah. a good example. Mercy everyone unto loved all him. creatures. A mercy unto all men. That's right. Why would anyone want to kill such a wonderful example to all human beings? It comes from the same source. This Jewess named Zainab. She was asked why did she uh, try to kill Muhammad by poisoning him. Let me read it to you. The Apostle of Allah sent for Zainab and he said to her, What induced you to do what you have done? Why did you try to kill me? She replied, Now I want everyone to pay attention the reason why this Jewess tried to kill Muhammad. It's not because it was out of envy that he was a true prophet who provided supernatural verification for his prophethood, but she couldn't stand the fact that he wasn't a Jew. Here's the reason. She replied, You have done to my people what you have done. You have killed my father, my uncle, and my, my husband. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. You killed my father, you killed my uncle, and you killed my husband. So I said to myself, if you're a prophet, the foreleg will inform you. And others have said, if you're a king, we will get rid of you. Notice what her reasoning was. To get back at the cold-blooded murders, he murdered her father, uncle, and husband. To get back at him, she tried to kill him, right? Well, it's eye for an eye. Mm -hmm. What you did to my family, I wanted to do to you for killing my family. But then notice what she said. If you're a prophet, then you would not die from the poison, right? Mm -hmm. That's what she says. Let me read it again. If you're a prophet, the foreleg will inform you. You're not going to die of the poison. You'll be protected. You're a prophet. Lo and behold, the next paragraph, notice what it says. The apostle of Allah lived after this three years, till in consequence of his pain, he passed away. During his illness, he used to say, I did not cease to find the effect of the poison morsel. I took it khaybar. And I suffered several times from its effects, but now I feel the hour has come of the cutting off of my jugular vein. Muhammad himself admits he died as a result of the poison. But what did she say? If you're not a prophet and just a king pretending to be a prophet, then this poison will kill you. What did Muhammad say? This poison killed me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's the conclusion? He's no prophet. And uh, a, a couple of more things uh, from... Uh, that, that, that we can gather from this story. Uh, Sahih Muslim, number 5430. Watch what this says. So j just, to, just to recap, Bishr died because he was convinced that Muhammad is a prophet and that he would not eat. Muhammad would not eat poison food. So his trust in Muhammad led him to do what Muhammad was doing. And this ultimately got him killed. So Bishr had his belief. And his trust and belief in Muhammad, in the prophethood of Muhammad, got him killed. Yep. Then you have this woman who, despite the fact that Muhammad had murdered so many people in her town and in her own family, she was still open. If this guy's a prophet, God's going to show me. She was still open, despite everything Muhammad had done. She was open to seeing whether Muhammad was a true prophet. But now you have one more little problem here. Sahih Muslim. Again, one of your most trusted sources. Anas reported that a Jewess came to Allah's messenger with poisoned mutton, and he took of what had been brought to him. When the effects of this poison were felt by him, he called for her and asked her about that, whereupon she said, I had determined to kill you. Thereupon he said, Allah will never give you the power to do it. Allah will never allow you to poison me. Allah will never allow that poison to kill me. Allah will not allow it. This is the same guy who tells you the Quran is the word of God. This is the word of God. He is declaring you will never be able to poison me. Then he, the narrator, said that they, the companions of Muhammad, said, should we not kill her? Thereupon he said no. And Anna said, I felt the effects on the uvula of Muhammad's I mean, of Allah's messenger. So the uvula, that's the back here, that's the little back of your throat there. So based on these passages, you could see the effects of the poison on Muhammad's palate and on uh, his uvula, the back of his throat. So this poison had an immediate effect on him. But as time went on, the effects grew worse and worse and worse until his followers are literally carrying him around while his feet are dragging on the ground. And ultimately, he dies complaining that he feels his aorta being severed. What do we have here? Bishr trusts Muhammad. His belief in Muhammad, his faith that Muhammad is a prophet, gets him killed. So Muhammad failed Bishr's test. Bishr's test was Muhammad's a prophet. Obviously, this food can't be poisoned. Bishr 
had a test. Muhammad failed that test. The Jewish woman had a test. If Muhammad is a true prophet, Muhammad is a true prophet, he will not eat this. Muhammad failed that test. He ate some of it and ultimately died because of it. Muhammad spoke as a prophet of God and said, Allah will never allow you to poison me. And then we've seen from your most, your most trusted collections of ahadith that Muhammad died saying it's because of this poison. Muhammad didn't die of old age, ladies and gentlemen. Muhammad might have lived another 30 or 40 years if he hadn't died from this poisoning. And yet Muhammad did die from the poison that he said would never have an effect on him. Muhammad died. So Muhammad's a false prophet according to Bishr. He's a false prophet according to Jewish woman. He's a false prophet according to his own words. And as we've seen, he's a false prophet according to the Quran. Again, the one person in history who dies complaining of his aorta being severed is the one person who said, if I'm telling a lie, if I'm deceiving people, Allah's going to sever my aorta. Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, I, I just wanted to bring up something mm -hmm. in what you were saying. Now... Someone could say, what do the, all this, this verse about cutting off the A order, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. Implications, Who's to huh? say that? I was just reading Ibn Kathir. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of Ibn Kathir? Huh. Ibn Kathir, you mean the Who's greatest he? Sunni Islamic commentator of all time? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. This is the, one of the, the most accepted sources on the explanation of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And when he talks about the verse where it says, and if he had forged a false saying concerning us, what he says the reason why Allah would cut his uh, aorta. Mm -hmm. Why would he do this? He would do this if Muhammad forged something from us, as they claim, who is they, and added or removed anything from our message or said anything from himself while attributing it to us, meaning Allah, God, mm -hmm. then we would surely be swift in punishing him. Mm -hmm. So I think that needs to be made clear. Why, why is, uh, would Allah do this? The criteria, criteria why Allah would do this punishment is that Muhammad would say something false, false prophecies. He would put himself as a false prophet. He was not truthful as people were accusing him of. Mm -hmm. This was supposed to be a test, a proof that Muhammad was a prophet, yet he failed. Mm -hmm. Precisely. So Absolutely. the implication basically is that if Muhammad died because he felt that his aorta was being cut off, then obviously that's the work of Allah. But if Allah did it, then that means he died. Uh, under the wrath of Allah and his displeasure. So he did not die in a state of peace or salvation. That's the implication. Mm -hmm. So that according to the Quran, you're saying basically, both of you, Muhammad dies condemned and under the wrath of his own God. Mm -hmm. Now why would that be the case? What do you think? What was the reason, Dave, do you think Allah cut off his aorta? Uh, well, again, as a, as a Christian, I'm not sure that this had anything to do with God. But you as a Muslim, you who believe it, that the Quran is the word of God, you've got a problem because you have in the Quran, you want a sign that Muhammad's a false prophet, here's your sign. His aorta is going, going to be cut. And then I don't believe in Muhammad. I, I, I don't even trust many of your sources that much. But in your sources that you trust, your prophet says when he's dying, I feel my aorta being severed. And I don't know how this doesn't bother you as a Muslim. But... Uh, Again, as, as we said, we believe that, that God might intervene in a man who's uh, leading lots of people astray. God yeah. might intervene to give a sign to whom? To people like you, to people out there who are watching, who uh, already believe in Muhammad or who are wondering, hey, maybe Muhammad is a prophet. People who are out there watching, we believe God can give a sign. So what sort of sign might he give? Well, as we brought up in the beginning... Suppose I say right here uh, on television, if I'm leading you astray, if I'm speaking falsehood, may God strike me with lightning. Well, chances are if I talk like that, I'm probably not a very reliable person because true messengers don't need to talk like that. But suppose, suppose I say, if I'm lying to you right now, may God strike me with lightning. And all of a sudden, wow, <laughs> lightning strikes and I drop dead. Well, then you'd have... Two proofs that I'm a false prophet. One, I'm giving a ridiculous excuse for evidence that I'm speaking the truth. And number two, the ridiculous evidence that I demanded happened. It happened. And here you have Muhammad doing the exact same thing. He's giving this ridiculous, absurd argument. If I'm lying, God is going to cut my aorta. And then that just happens to be the guy who's dying while complaining 
that his aorta yeah. is being cut. Exactly. Wow. Is that a coincidence? Uh, that's quite disturbing. Yep. Now, we're going to have to take a break in a moment, but um, why, as Sam brought up, why might God want to stop Muhammad from preaching falsehood? Why might God want to stop Muhammad from leading people astray? Uh, the question is, do we have evidence that Muhammad's claims were false, that Muhammad was leading people astray, yep. perhaps about Jesus, perhaps about God, perhaps about God's nature? Do we have evidence of this? Do we have evidence of other times when Muhammad was speaking falsehoods against God? In fact, don't we have in the Muslims' own sources, in Islam's own sources, that Muhammad spoke falsehood on behalf of God? Yes, exactly. That's, uh, in fact, you had a debate on that topic, did you not? Yes, I had a debate uh, the on the verses. satanic verses with a Muslim named Adnan Rashid. And again, we encourage the, the audience to go and watch that debate online for free by going to Dave's blog. David Wood has a blog, answeringmuslims.com, www.answeringmuslims.com. He had a debate with a Salafi Muslim. He was a Salafi, was he not? Mm -hmm. Adnan Rashid. On whether Muhammad uttered the satanic verses. And if we have a few moments... Maybe, Dave, you can sum up real quickly what the satanic verses are and how Muhammad put in the mouth of God verses mm -hmm. that actually did not come okay. from him. All right, well, we're going to take a quick break. We'll and when we come back, we'll okay. go into some of the evidence of Muhammad actually leading people astray about God, not according to us, according to Muslim sources. And then we'll uh, see how Muhammad led people astray uh, about the gospel. And we'll start taking callers when we come back. And we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad here with my brothers Sam Shamoon and C.L. Edwards. Uh, we've been talking about Muhammad. We've been talking about a little test that Muhammad presented to people. Uh, he said that if he happened to be speaking falsehoods, God would sever his aorta. And we looked at several passages. And if you want more, call in. We'll give you plenty more passages from Islam's most trusted collection, saying that Muhammad died, complaining that he could feel his aorta being severed. Now, this doesn't look a lot like a coincidence. I'm, 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 I'm skeptical about things that are supernatural involving Muhammad. But uh, if anything, if there's any miracle involved in the life of Muhammad, it would have to be this one. Muhammad says, if I'm, a, if I'm a false prophet, if I'm leading people astray, this is how I'm going to die. And that was exactly how he died. Uh, pretty interesting stuff going on there. And uh, that probably has something to do with the fact that so few Muslims know so little about the death of Muhammad. You don't want to start telling people that Muhammad died complaining of feeling his aorta being severed when that same Muslim might be reading the Quran one day and see Muhammad say, well... If I'm leading people astray, God's going to sever my aorta. So the question is, what sort of things might Muhammad have done that qualified as leading people astray about God? Interestingly, we find this in the Muslim sources. We find in the Muslim sources that Muhammad spoke falsehood on behalf of God. So as Christians, we would say Muhammad said lots of false things. But it's interesting when we have that, according to Muslim sources, Muhammad making false claims. So as an example, the satanic verses. It's an interesting story. You don't hear a lot about this from Muslim sources anymore. Uh, but in the earliest Muslim sources, the earliest Muslim scholars, this was everywhere. This was all over the place. The most reliable uh, sources within the first century, I'm talking people like Ibn Abbas, were reporting that Muhammad delivered revelations from the devil. Yes, you heard that right. Muhammad's companions reporting that he had delivered revelations from the the devil, not according to me, not according to Jews, not according to Christians, not according to atheists, according to Muhammad's companions. What happened? Well, the basic story goes like this. Muhammad was upset that so few people were converting to Islam. I know Muslims like to believe that Muhammad started preaching and people just started bowing down. Nonsense, nonsense. Muhammad won very few followers when he was just preaching. Muhammad started winning more and more followers when he started conquering and saying, hey, come join with me and you'll split the rewards. That's when Muhammad started winning lots of followers. But during this early period, when Muhammad is just preaching and using the eloquence of the Quran, he won practically no followers at all. He had a few dozen at this time. So Muhammad gets a few dozen followers preaching the Quran. Everyone else is rejecting it. 
And he feels very upset that so few people are converting to Islam. He wants his tribe, he wants the Quraysh to convert to Islam. And he was longing, according to the story, this is not according to me, this is according to Muslim sources. Muhammad is longing for a revelation from God that would help the Quraysh convert to Islam. One day, Muhammad got what he was looking for. Uh, Muhammad was uh, delivering Surah 53 of the Quran, and suddenly, according to the story, Satan slipped some revelations. And so what Muhammad said to his followers was, Have you not heard of Alat, Alus, and Manat, the third, the other? These were uh, three pagan goddesses that were very dear to the people of Mecca. Muhammad said, Have you not heard of Alat, Alus, and Manat, the third, the other? These are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. So the idea is that these, were three, these three goddesses are compared to birds who are exalted and can carry your prayers up to Allah. And so you uh, hope for their intercession. You hope that they can intercede for you. Take your prayers up to Allah. Well, the pagans were overjoyed that Muhammad had spoken favorably of their goddesses. And here's what happened. They bowed down. So Muhammad bows down in honor of receiving this revelation. His followers bow down in honor of receiving this revelation. And all the pagans who are overjoyed that Muhammad was now promoting polytheism and promoting their goddesses, they bowed down too. Muhammad's happy. Muhammad's happy. Now they're getting on board with my religion. But according to the story, a little later, Muhammad comes back and says, Sorry. You know those verses that I delivered? You know those verses that I delivered? Uh, they didn't really come from God. They came from Satan. Satan tricked me into delivering these revelations to you. Uh, God doesn't really accept these other goddesses, and they can't intercede for you. Now, what does this mean? Why would this be embarrassing for the early Muslim community? Well, one, Muhammad committed shirk. He associated three goddesses with Allah. You have your prophet, who many Muslims still tell me today, I don't know why, but many Muslims still tell me that Muhammad was sinless or at least free of all major sin. And here you have the worst possible sin, shirk, being committed by Muhammad. So Muhammad committed shirk. This is also a major problem because according to Moses, whom you Muslims claim to believe in, Muhammad should have been put to death as a false prophet. That's not according to me. That's according to Moses. Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, that if someone delivers a revelation that doesn't come from God, if someone claims to be speaking on behalf of God and gives a revelation that doesn't come from God, or two, speaks in the name of other gods, the false prophet has to die. You Muslims claim to believe in Moses. But if Moses had been in charge when Muhammad brought these verses, Moses would have ordered the people to pick up stones and stone Muhammad to death as a false prophet. And again, this isn't according to us. This is not according to C.L. Edwards or Sam Shimon or David Wood. This is according to Muslim sources. This is according to people like Ibn Abbas, the founder of Quranic Studies, saying Muhammad delivered these verses. And these verses show that he's a false prophet. These are the sorts of things we find when we go to the Muslim sources. And later on, it shouldn't be surprising that Muhammad, who's saying, God's going to strike me down if I'm a false prophet, dies in exactly the way he said God would strike him down. Sam, what else do we have? Yes. In fact, I, I don't know uh, how many of our audience uh, <clears throat> may be aware of the fact that according to the classical Muslim commentators, two specific verses were quote-unquote revealed. I keep saying revealed in quotations because as Christians, we do not believe the Quran is revelation from the true God. Again, notice my qualification, revelation from the true God. I am persuaded that much of what we find in the Quran are things that Muhammad picked up, but also that Muhammad was inspired by a spirit who wasn't the true Holy Spirit of the living God. We can discuss that in a future session, or if someone wants to call in and ask me to elaborate on that point, I don't mind. But according to the classical commentators, chapter 6, verse 93 of the Quran, chapter 6, verse 93, and chapter 16, verse 106, were composed in part to rebuke an apostate named Abdullah ibn Abisar. Abisar happens to be the foster brother of Uthman ibn Affan. Who's Uthman? He was the third caliph, the third caliph. Let me read just chapter 6, verse 93, and, and the audience will see the relevance of this passage and the expositor's interpretation of this passage have on what David said and what the Quran said would happen to Muhammad if he forged uh, chapters or sayings and attributed it to his God Allah. 6, verse 93. Who is more wicked? 
than the man who invents a falsehood about Allah or says, this was revealed to me, I'm receiving revelation from Allah, when nothing was revealed to him. Or the man who says, I can reveal the like of what God has revealed. Notice the last part. Or the man who says, I can reveal the like of what Allah, God has revealed. Now, let's see what Al-Qurtubi says. Al-Qurtubi happens to be one of the greatest Muslim expositors and one of the main commentators that Muslims appeal to to properly understand the context of the Quran. My brother here can confirm that some of the expositors that Muslims consult to understand the Quran and its context happen to include Ibn Kathir, Al-Tabari, Al-Qurtubi, as well as the two Jalals, Jalalain, and a host of others, one of which I'll also quote Al-Baydawi. And he's also an important expositor. But let me see what Qurtubi says about chapter 6, verse 93. The pronoun man is grammatically in the jar case. The meaning is, who is more wicked than he who said, I can reveal? The person addressed here is Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abisar. Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abisar. Who used to write the revelation for the Prophet of God. He's one of Muhammad's scribes. Later on, he apostatized and joined the pagans. Now, why did he do that? Why did he apostatize? Here, the reason given by the commenta commentators is that when verse... 23.12, chapter 23, verse 12 of the Quran, was quote-unquote revealed. We created man of an extraction of clay. The Prophet called him and dictated to him. And what, when the Prophet reached the end of Surah 23.14, here are the words, thereafter we produced him as another creature. Abdullah said in amazement, so blessed be Allah, the fairest of creators. The Prophet said, now notice this, Dave. This is Abdullah who said that in amazement. He stood in awe of what the Quran said about Allah and His creating man. The Prophet said, and thus it was revealed to me. In other words, what you just said, Abdullah, is revealed to me, included in the chapter. In fact, can you do me a favor, Brother Dave? Can you go to Surah 2314 and read how that Surah ends? As you get there, let me read Abdullah's response. When Muhammad said what Abdullah just said was revealed to me, Allah revealed what you just said to me, included which made Abdullah doubt. He started doubting and said, if Muhammad is truthful, then I received the revelation, and if he lied, I say of the like of his speech. In other words, if he's right, then I'm inspired too, because it came from my mouth. But if he's lying, then I'm able to reveal something like the Quran. You see his logic? Impeccable, right? Mm -hmm. Notice what he's saying. Wait, 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 wait. Muhammad, you said that just what came out of my mouth was revealed to you, but it came from me. That means I'm just as inspired as you. But if you're lying, then I'm able to produce something like the Quran because you took my uninspired words and made it part of the revelation. You know what that is? That's a burst of common sense. That is a burst of common sense. My friends, you can, you can find all kinds of evidence that Muhammad was a false prophet. And here on this program, we give it to you. We give you all kinds of evidence. If you just read the Muslim sources, this stuff will jump out at you. And here you have one of Muhammad's companions. And a scribe. Who, who converted to Islam. A man who is sitting there writing the Quran as Muhammad speaks it. And what does he say? If this guy's a prophet, then I'm a prophet because I'm writing this stuff too. And, and see if, if Muhammad included his words in Surah 23, yeah, 14. Yeah, let, let's go. So this is Surah 23, verse 14. And this, so this verse is interesting for two reasons. One, because it's totally scientifically inaccurate. And two, because it includes the words, not of Muhammad, not the words that he received, but something that's... Something that one of his companions exclaimed when he was hearing it. So this man was inspired too. He's a source of part of the Quran. Let's read it. Then fashioned we the drop a clot. Then fashioned we the clot a little lump. Then fashioned we the little lump bones. Then clothed the bones with flesh. This is describing embryonic development, and it's totally, totally wrong what happens here. Uh, then clothed the bones with flesh, and then produced it another creation. So blessed be Allah, the best of creators. That, that was that a revelation was the words from God, of the best. Oh, wow. He said, praise be Allah, blessed be Allah, the best, the fairest of all creators. And Muhammad <laughs> said, oh, that's revealed to me. Put it down. Now, now think about this. Mah think about the irony here. Muhammad is claiming that this verse is revealed by Allah, and it's telling him about the development of a fetus in the mother. It's totally wrong, so there's no way this is from God. Yeah. It's totally, completely, utterly false in its description of how the fetus develops. And then you have one of Muhammad's companions 
exclaims when he hears this and he thinks, aha, it's finally been revealed. Even though it hasn't been revealed, it's totally wrong. He thinks it's been revealed how a baby develops in the mother's womb. And he says, blessed be Allah, the best to create. And Muhammad says, oh yeah, put that in there too. So you have a totally false verse. You have Muhammad's companions, which think that this is revelation from God. And so they praise Allah. And then Muhammad says, oh, that's a really good, nice, well-written praise you just came up with. Stick it in there. Revealed to me, by the way. Mm -hmm. And this is what's in, th this is according to Jewish scholars, right? No. That, these are Christian scholars? Some, no, no. Modern these are... Christian critics of Islam. No, Modern man. Islamophobes came up with this argument, No, right? some of the greatest expositors. In fact, just to show you that this is not an isolated opinion, I have a list of Muslim scholars, renowned, renowned Sunni scholars that admit this. But let me just read one more by Al-Baidawi. He's also another renowned Muslim expositor. Let me read what he says about the same verse. Does he agree with Qurtubi? To me it has been revealed when not has been revealed to him. Refers to Abdullah ibn Sa'ad ibn Abisar. So he agrees. Who used to write for Allah's messenger. The verse, Surah 23, 12, that says, We created man of an extraction of clay was revealed. When Muhammad reached the part that says, thereafter he produced him as another creature, which you read, Surah 23, 14, Abdullah said, so blessed be God, Allah, the fairest, the best of creators, in amazement at the details of man's creation. The prophet said, write it down, for thus it has been revealed. Abdullah doubted and said, if Muhammad is truthful, then I receive the re revelation as much as he does. And if he's a liar, what I said is as good as what he said. So here's another Orthodox Sunni Muslim scholar confirming that this episode is an episode that occurred in the life of Muhammad. So folks, what are you going to do with this? Here's a man who actually dictated to Muhammad words that Muhammad made part of the Quran. Could this be the reason why Allah killed them dead? Assuming again that Allah is the true God. Now we have all kinds of other examples and uh, callers are welcome to call in now and we can uh, bring up all kinds of other things that Muhammad said that were false and was obviously um, uh, didn't represent the truth well. But uh, there is a question. How does this compare with, with biblical figures? How would this compare with uh, the apostles? How would this compare with Old Testament prophets? Muhammad gets poisoned, says that it will never affect him, later on dies from it, complaining that he feels his aorta being severed exactly in the way that he said he would die if he's cursed by God as a false prophet. How does this compare with some of the biblical figures? CL? Well, you know the uh, line of reasoning among Islam and, you know, Islamic creed is that Muhammad, he's one of many prophets. Mm -hmm. He's just like the rest of the prophets. Mm -hmm. He's the last in line. So he should do what the other prophets have done. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, now, be able to, yeah. Now, are you aware of the Apostle Paul, who many Muslims <laughs> do not like? Yeah. They accuse the Apostle Paul. Paul of inventing Christianity, inventing the deity of Christ. He's the one who you Christians really follow Paul, not Jesus. And that Muslims have to hate, I mean, have to hate Paul. He's more powerful than Allah. Uh. According to, I mean, according to the Quran, God gave a revelation. Uh, through Jesus and promised that his followers would be victorious until the day of resurrection. But then the Apostle Paul came in there, totally corrupted everything. God, Allah just couldn't <laughs> stop him, despite the fact that he said he would preserve the true followers of Allah, Jesus. Allah. It was just disastrous. But yeah, how would this person, who's more powerful than Allah, what happened when he was poisoned? Well, Paul, in the book of Acts, in the chapter 28, starting, let's say, around verse number three. It, let me give a little background before I read it. He's on a ship. He's traveling, right? And this incident happens similar to what happened to Muhammad. Verse number three, verse uh, of chapter 28 in Acts, it says, When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, though he has escaped from the sea. Justice has now allowed him to live. Justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. So, hold on. Paul gets bitten by a poisonous viper, and the poison does not affect him? No. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, look at, look at the different situations here. Think about this, my friends. Muhammad says, this poison will not affect me. And his followers say, 
this poison is not going to fail. I'll just keep eating this food because this poison, it, it can't be poison. And then Muhammad dies ultimately from the poison after suffering for a couple of years. That's what you have in Islam. And here in Christianity, the Apostle Paul gets bitten by a, by a snake. All of the people around him say, he's dead. He's a criminal. This is why justice has not allowed him to live. He's going to drop dead. Paul shakes it off into the fire. It's nothing. It has no effect. What hmm. impact do you think that made on the people there? I don't know. Hmm. How you can believe in Muhammad when you have this contrast here. We don't believe in Paul. Paul's an evil deceiver. Poison wouldn't affect him at all. Muhammad, we believe, is a true prophet when he was poisoned, died exactly how he said he'd die if he's a false prophet. Strange, mm. strange stuff going on here. Anything else mm. from the Bible you'd like to point out? Well, uh, there's actually another story in the Bible similar to what happened to Muhammad. Surprisingly, um, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament uh, prophet Elijah, there was an incident that happened with him. Um, this can be found in Second Kings chapter number four. You can read from th verse 38 to verse 41. Give a little background before I get into it. He gathers with a company of prophets and they're going to eat. Right. And one of the prophets goes out and he pits some, uh, you know, some gourds and different things from the land. He cuts it up. He puts it in the pot and makes a stew and he's going to serve it to Elisha and all the rest of the prophets. Now, it says here, um, the stew was poured out for the men. Now, these are prophets. But as they began to eat, they cried out, "O man of God, there is death in this pot and they could not eat it. Elisha said, get some flour. He put it into the pot and said, serve it to the people to eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. Wait, you're telling me a companions of a prophet was saved miraculously by the true God from dying from the effects of poison? Yes, sir. But that God's greatest prophet, according to Muslims, the last prophet. His companion, Bishr, died because of the effects of poison? Uh-huh. Hmm. What's going on here? And he know. died because of the effects yeah. of poison? Well, hey, I don't know. Well... Well, this seems very odd to me. I mean, <laughs> you're not the <laughs> only one. <laughs> Where's the logic? Of us. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Here's yeah. a man whom, who is one of the greatest prophets, but we don't consider him to be the greatest prophet, Elisha. Yet God in his mercy protected his com companions from suffering the ill effects of poison. Yet Muhammad, who Muslims say is the perfect man, Al-Insan Al-Kamil, the seal of the prophets, the greatest messenger, uh, the chief of all the children uh, of Adam, right? He is the Sayyid. He is the master, the chief of all the children of Adam. And he's also the chief of all the prophets. When it came to saving his companion from dying from the effects of poison, Allah actually let him die. Didn't intervene, didn't save his life, especially when Bishr ate the food and refused to spit it out out of his love for his prophet. And yet Muhammad's God still didn't intervene to save his beloved, because they call mm -hmm. Muhammad Habib Allah, the beloved of Allah, the companion of his beloved. And yet we're supposed to believe he's the greatest man, the greatest prophet, superior to all the prophets before him, their leader. God forbid such blasphemy. Hmm. Hmm. All right, well, we have a caller back there. Should we take a call now? All right. Who's our first caller? Uh, hello. Am I, am I on the air? Yes. How are you? Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. This is Jabari. I called in yesterday. From Lebanon. Uh, no, oh, Jabari. I'm sorry. I thought you were the guy from Lebanon. I'm Jabari's sorry. calling from Jabari. California or something. Sorry. All right. I still love you, Jabari, even if you're not from Lebanon. Uh, uh, thanks, Sam. Um, it's interesting what you're talking about. Um, strangely, you, Muhammad said that God strike him, said that God strike me dead. My father's a false prophet. It reminds me of the Mubahala, the prayer duel, where you pray that God curse me if my if my beliefs are false. Or bless mm -hmm. me if my beliefs are true. Mm -hmm. Another thing I want to say is, is that, is that because of his sudden death, they had no none of the Muslims knew who was going to be the true the ruler after Muhammad's death, and hence the they've been the Muslim community has been divided into Sunni and Shia, mm -hmm. and they've been fighting ever since. Another thing I want to say is, is that it's like trusting I'm a bishop. He went to his death because he trusted in Muhammad, and all these Muslims will go to a spiritual death if they keep on trusting Muhammad and they start trust, and and they won't have eternal life if they trust in Jesus. Um, last thing, also, Sam, could you elaborate on that spirit which uh, I'm a uh, aided Muhammad? Because I kind of think of the spirit spirit was 
I'm a spirit was like demonic or something like that. They gave him some of the stuff that that's in the Quran, and it's keeping a lot of Muslims from the gospel. Oh, I see. All right, uh, that's all I have to say. All right. So, uh, from his question is, he wants me to elaborate my reason for believing that Muhammad was oppressed and inspired by an evil spirit. Did I hear him correctly? Because his voice was coming in and out. I think so. Yeah. Uh, uh, just let me comment briefly yes, on the first thing you said because it's yes. shorter. Yes. Um, uh, Jabari did bring up a very interesting point, namely, you don't just have Muhammad dying of this poison, um, which would be a strange enough event in itself. You don't just have Muhammad dying of this poison in a horrible way that he said Allah would never allow and happened to be exactly how he said Allah would kill him if he's a false prophet. You don't just have that. You have the impact of that death. Namely, Muhammad dies. No one knows who's supposed to lead because Muhammad wasn't supposed to be dead. Again, Muhammad might have lived another 30 years if he hadn't been poisoned. Uh, by a exactly. woman that Muhammad said could never poison him. Uh, but he did die. He did die, and the result was chaos in the Muslim community, and Muslims started slaughtering each other. And as we pointed out yesterday, uh, the first generation of Muslims uh, eventually started slaughtering each other. 10,000 Muslims were slaughtered by two armies, led, one of them, by Aisha, Muhammad's wife, the, uh, the mother of the faithful, and the other army led by Ali, the commander of the faithful. Two of the most beloved people to Muhammad slaughtering each other in the name of Allah. That's the sort of chaos that resulted from Muhammad's death. Uh, so it's not just Muhammad's death, which seems to be confirmation that he's a false prophet. It's also the impact. Uh, you wonder, uh, wh why? If Allah, if, if Allah is really on Muhammad's side, why didn't he do what Muhammad said, namely prevent that poison from affecting him? Uh, certainly didn't. The result was havoc in the Muslim community down to today. This is still having, when you, when you see on the news, Sunnis killing Shias, Shias killing Sunnis, Muslims blowing up one another as mosques, it goes back to that, to Muhammad's death and not appointing a leader and Muslims not knowing what to do. That's the result. But go ahead. Yeah, here's some of the reasons why I'm convinced that although Muhammad was heavily influenced by Jews and Christians and pagans, so he got many of the stories from them orally. Many people tell well, Muhammad couldn't, couldn't read or write, therefore he couldn't copy from books. Well, you don't need to read, and, read or write to be able to transmit what you hear orally from these communities. So I do believe that a lot of the Quran <clears throat> contains the oral stories that Muhammad heard from Jews and Christians and pagans, which he thought were inspired truths and he incorporated to the Quran. However, <clears throat> I also am convinced that it was a spirit that oppressed Muhammad and inspired him convincing him he was a prophet of the true God. I don't think that Muhammad simply one day came up with the idea, okay, I'm going to claim to be a prophet, and there you go. I do believe a spirit appeared to him and convinced him that he was a true prophet of the true God. Little did he realize that spirit wasn't from the true God. It was an unclean spirit, be it Satan or some demon. Now, the reason why I believe that is because of what I find in the Muslim sources and how embarrassing these sources are on the credibility of Muhammad's prophethood. And what do I mean? If you turn to Sahil Bukhari, Sahil Bukhari, the most authentic traditions attributed to Muhammad and his companions, compiled by Imam al-Bukhari, Sahil Bukhari, volume 1, number 3, and this particular one from Bukhari, which I'll read. Sahil Bukhari, volume 9, book 87, number 111. Volume 9, number 111. And by the way, you can find Bukhari's entire collection in English online for free. Just do a search and you'll find it on several websites. It's available. The Halali Khan translation. Let me read the first portion to see why I'm convinced that Muhammad had an encounter with an evil, unclean spirit. Narrated Aisha. The commencement of the divine inspiration to Allah's apostle was in the form of good, righteous dreams in a sleep. <clears throat> he never had a dream, but that it came true like bright daylight. He used to go in seclusion to the cave of Hira, or Hira, uh, where he used to worship continuously for many nights. He used to take with him the journey for food, etc., etc. Now watch this. <clears throat> Until that suddenly the truth descended upon him. The truth descended upon him while he was in the cave of Hira or Hira, however you want to pronounce that word. The angel came to him and asked him to read. The prophet replied, I do not know how to read. The prophet added, the angel caught me forcefully and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it anymore. Notice that this so-called angel is physically manhandling, tormenting Muhammad. 
And he doesn't do it once, he does it three times, right? <clears throat> he then released me and again asked me to read. And I replied, I do not know how to read. You think that the Spirit would get it the first time that this man doesn't know how to read. Whereupon he caught me, uh, caught me again and pressed me a second time till I could not bear it anymore. He then released me and asked me again to read. But again I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me for the third time, pressed me, and then released me and said, Read in the name of your Lord. Notice that this spirit, manhandled, physically traumatized Muhammad. It says that Muhammad went to Khadija shivering, trembling with his heart palpitating. And he asked her to cover him. And then according to other sources, he told Khadija that he thinks something bad has happened to him. And according to one report, he said he thinks he's majnoon, possessed by a jinn. That's what he thought. Initially, he thought he's possessed. So Khadija takes him to her first cousin, Waraka, who was supposedly a Christian, who would read the gospel in Hebrew and write it in Hebrew as much as Allah will. That's what it says here. And then the Christian said, no, by God, the spirit that came to you, same spirit that came to Moses, the namus that came to you is the same namus that came to Moses. And by the way, namus is an Arabic loanword from the Greek nomos, meaning law. In other words, the same law that came to Moses is now being given to you so that you can pass it on to your community. But what's interesting is that when Waraka died, shortly after Waraka's death, here's how Muhammad responded. But after a few days, Waraka died, and the divine inspiration was also paused for a while, and the prophet became so sad, as we have heard, that he intended several times, not once, David, not, not, not once, CL, but several times, he tried to throw himself off the top of the mountain. In other words, to commit suicide. But then Gabriel would appear and then comfort him saying, you are the messenger of Allah. So notice two things. Muhammad was manhandled to the point he thought he was demon-possessed. And when the so-called revelation paused, wouldn't come to him after that event, Muhammad decided to commit suicide on several occasions. Now I want everyone, Muslim or Christian, to look through the entire Bible, look through the entire Quran, Find me any other prophet or messenger who had a similar experience that Muhammad did after either encountering the divine, encountering God, or one of his messengers or the Holy Spirit. In point of fact, what you find throughout the Bible and the Quran is that when the prophets and messengers see either God or see the Holy Spirit or see an angel, their first reaction is fear. But what does the divine do? Comforts them and says to them, do not be afraid. Let me give you one example. Gabriel comes to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 35. Gabriel comes to Mary, and Mary was troubled. What does Gabriel say? Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with your Lord. You have found favor with God. Luke 1, 26 to 35. Another example. Revelation chapter 1. John sees the resurrected and glorified Christ in his glory. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. This is what it says. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. When I saw him... I fell at his feet as though dead. He placed his right hand upon me and said, Do not be afraid. See that, CL? I see. Do not be afraid. I am, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I live forevermore. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Here, you find Muhammad, instead of being comforted, he is manhandled three consecutive times, and he thinks he's demon-possessed and wants to commit suicide. Now, I'm convinced that this story has a ring of truth. Now, why do I say that? This passes what we call the criterion or principle of embarrassment. This is such an embarrassing story, I can't imagine for the life of me any Muslim making it up if it didn't have some truth to it. In other words, when people make up stories about their heroes and people they love more than their own lives, human tens tendency is to make them look better than what they are. But here, this story makes Muhammad look very bad and uncertain regarding the source of the revelation. Therefore, I'm persuaded to assume that this has a ring of truth, that Muhammad did encounter a spirit, but it was a wicked spirit masquerading as a righteous spirit in order to deceive him into thinking he's a prophet from the true God. And I have other reasons, but I guess for the sake of time and callers, I'll just... Did you want to say something, Siel? Yeah, something that you said that struck me and made me think of Second Corinthians exactly. chapter 11, number 14. Where it says, and no wonder, even Satan disguised himself as an angel Amen. of light. 
So it is no surprise his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Do me a favor. Since you're in 2 Corinthians 11, read for me verses 2 to 4. How, how do we know whether a spirit is from God or a Satan or a wicked spirit masquerading as a righteous angel? How do we know? If you read 2 to 4, specifically verse 4 for the sake of time, just read 4. Okay. That's, 2 uh... Corinthians 11, 4. For the Christians and Muslims, this is how we know whether a spirit is from the true God or it's a wicked spirit, an unclean spirit, maybe even Satan himself, masquerading as a righteous angel from God. Verse 4 tells you. Okay. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus... Which Muhammad did. Another mm -hmm. Jesus. Then the one we proclaim, mm -hmm. or if you receive a different spirit from the one you receive... And according to Islamic theology, the Holy Spirit is not the third person of the Godhead, but Angel Gabriel, so it's mm -hmm. a different spirit. Or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted... You put up with it readily enough. Muhammad preached a different gospel. And according to Paul, those are characteristics of a person who's been deceived by Satan into thinking he's an apostle of the true God. A, another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. In fact, according to 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 to 23, 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 to 23, here's the profile of an antichrist. 1 John 2, 22 to 23. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. And the Muslims say, wait a minute. We don't deny Jesus is the Christ. So Muhammad is no liar. He's not an imposter. But wait, let's finish the passage. Such a person is the Antichrist. Such a person is the Antichrist. Denying the Father and the Son, CL. Hmm. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Well, according to Muhammad in the Quran, Allah is the Father to no one. And Jesus is definitely not his Son. And Jesus did not die on the cross for our sins. And Muhammad even goes so far to call Jesus Isa, which is not the Arabic equivalent or cognate of Jesus' Hebrew name. In Hebrew, Jesus' name is Yeshua, the Arabic cognate. And we have Arabic-speaking Christians listening. They can confirm this. In the Arabic New Testament, Jesus is called Yeshua, not Isa. Where in the world did he get Isa from? Well, if someone wants to call in and ask me, I will quote a Muslim who even tells us the origin of his name. And it's a, it's a damning confession, further proving that Muhammad was an antichrist inspired by the spirit of antichrist. All right, well, we have to go to a break now. We'll come back in a moment uh, to take some more callers. So we'll see you uh, in just a moment back here on Jesus or Muhammad. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. I understand we have some callers back there. Let's go right to them. Who do we have on the line? Hello, we got a caller? Hello? Yes. Hello? Hi, yes. we're here. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Good, and you? We're Glory good. Glory to God. Hi. Glory um, to Jesus. Yes, yes. How you doing, Brother Stan? This is Emmanuel from Connecticut. Hey, Manny, what it is? Hey. hey. What's going on, brother? How you doing? I'm all good, right. Good. That's another brother from a different mother like no other. What's going on? Yes, yes, sir. Hey, I just wanted to read a passage to you guys that further condemns Muhammad as a false prophet. Go uh -huh. ahead. Muslims, like Muslims like to point out that oh this is a uh, this is not a uh, you don't have any manuscript support for this this is this is not official but it still condemns them as a false prophet. Mark chapter sixteen, yeah. verses seventeen through eighteen. Yeah, read it for us, brother. It says, yes, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall cast out devils, they shall speak speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, that's the key thing <laughs> right there. It yeah. shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. Exactly. So Jesus is saying the true apostles that he sends out, he will protect them from failing in their divine mission and prevent their enemies from killing them. And yet Muhammad, who's the greatest messenger, Allah not only failed to protect them, but it seems that it was Allah who actually killed them dead. Exactly. Wow. And I, I, just want, I just wanted to read that because, you know, they, they love to run to this, you know, and I've Notice from different debates that I've watched you guys do, they love to point this out. They love to point this out. Shabir Ali loves to point this out. So, you know, what they love to point, point out can just be turned right around and just used against them. Praise God. And Emmanuel, I pray in Jesus' name, you and I see face to face. I'll rejoice in the day when yes, we sir. can see each other and hang out with each other and worship Jesus together because you're a solid brother. May the Lord bless you and your family and use you mightily in Connecticut. Yes, thank you, sir. I, I appreciate everything you guys do. I learned a lot from you guys, and I just, you know, just pray that you guys keep it going, man. Amen. Amen. We love you for the sake of the Lord, brother. May the Lord, risen Lord bless you. Love you. Love all you guys, too. Amen, All brother. right. Yeah. Thank you, brother. And let's go on to the next caller. Who do we have on the line? Jesus or Muhammad? Pray that you guys keep it going, man. Amen. Amen. We love you for the sake of the Lord, 
We can't hear the call. Who is it? Who's the next caller? Uh, here we have Franco on the line. We can't hear him, though. Uh, hello. Yes. Hey, Franco. Yo, what's up? Hey, um, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm from Atlanta. I'm a Christian. Oh. I was just uh, wondering if I can ask a question. Sure. Hmm? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to call yesterday, but I ran out of time. But you I was just... Uh, uh, I was uh, looking at Walid Shobat's uh, video. Yes. And uh, it's about... It's about the uh, it's about the uh, the revelation about the the number six six six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what did Shabbat saying? It was uh, it was uh, Bismillah. Yeah, that it corresponds to the way Allah spelled in Arabic. Yeah, but well, when I was look when I was looking at number six six six, yeah, and I look at uh, the Quran, Surah sixty six. Uh, Surah, Surah chapter 66, verse 6, and it's describing Allah as Satan. Okay, uh, so you're asking whether we we believe that um, 666 in Greek corresponds to Allah in Arabic? Surah 66, 6. So that, we, that it corresponds to Allah in Arabic? Yeah, you guys notice it? Yeah, actually, I'm going to direct you to an excellent article written by one of the greatest New Testament, Greek New Testament, his name Dr. Daniel B. Wallace. He wrote yeah. an article, and you can find a link to this article on Dr. James R. White's uh, website. James R. White also appears on ABN. He's an outstanding Christian scholar. Uh, you can go to his website, www.aomin.org. Go there. Do a search for Daniel Wallace 666. He'll direct you to the article showing that the Greek letters 666 do not correspond to the Arabic letters for Allah. They don't. And that's no that's not intended to be disrespectful to Walid Shobat. He has done some outstanding things, but uh -huh. none of us none of us happen to be perfect. We all make mistakes. Unfortunately, I make too many mistakes, but I pray the Lord forgive me and protect me from those mistakes. That is a position not supported by the evidence. So brother, if you want to share solid truth that's based on solid facts, I would encourage you stay away from that argument. Yeah, but I was wondering why nobody ever used uh, chapter 66 and verse 6. Because I just Quran. told you why. I just spent about two minutes telling you why. Uh, uh -huh. There is no correlation between the Greek numbers or the Greek letters for 666 and the Arabic letters for Allah. If you want to yeah, say I, that's I know, Muhammad, you have a problem. If you go to chapter 66, verse 6. No, he's six. saying why not just use the numbers uh, because as the, the reason as the here's reference. the Here's the reason why, brother. It yeah. depends on your view of eschatology, last things. Do you believe Revelation is referring to the return of Christ from heaven? Then Revelation 13 is still a future event, an event that hasn't occurred because Muhammad died and was buried and Jesus did not descend. So you need to be cautious in how you interpret Revelation because you have to determine whether Revelation is speaking of the return of Christ. Then if so, Revelation 13 will be fulfilled shortly before Christ comes down or whether this is referring to events leading up to 70 A.D. Now, that's another topic for another program, and I'd be more than willing to come on that show and discuss my view of end times. Suffice it to say, Christ will return physically, bodily from heaven to judge the living and dead. But that would be for another topic for another time, because we don't have time to develop those arguments. All right, thank you, thank brother. You, brother. Uh, I think we have Steve on the line. Yes, hi. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Hey, Hello, Steve. How, how are you, you man? Good, good. I have a question. It's not about Islam, or, but it's about a, a scholar who is uh, very good at mathematics. He says that uh, the rapture is going to take place this coming May on the 21st, <laughs> according to the uh, Hebrew calendar and yeah. according to the flood that occurred uh, in Noah's time. God revealed the secret to Noah. Yeah. And then he revealed the secret. There's a His verse in Steve? the Bible that says, uh, God revealed the secret to those who fear him. And he revealed yeah. the so, secret to those who fear him. Brother Steve. Yeah. The, 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 Brother the, Steve. The, the, so the, the, Bible Brother says, Steve. The Bible says you'll be able to figure out, based on the Jewish calendar, when the yeah. rapture will occur, right? Yeah, well, that what it says? well, that's what I'm saying. Brother Steve, let's make it short and cut to the chase. Any Christian who tells you a precise date is sinning against God and going beyond what is written. Mark 13.32 settles it for me. I don't care how many scholars you gather and tell me, this date, this hour, Jesus says this in Mark 13.32.
but of that day or hour no man knows, neither the angels nor the Son, but only the Father. So if this scholar is telling you the date, then he knows more than even the Son of God. Be careful of scholars who give you an exact date. They are sinning against the Lord and going beyond what is written. So I think we can cut that question short. Mark 13, 32, Matthew 24, 36 answers it decisively. No Christian has any business assigning a date for either the rapture or the descent of Christ from heaven to judge the living and the dead. Let me, let me give one more passage very quickly because um, I, don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if anyone's noticed, but pretty much every year someone predicts this is the date yeah. of this year when the rapture is going to occur. It's, I remember someone doing this when I was a kid, and they told me, you better get saved. I didn't, I didn't even believe in God. People are telling me, you better go get saved because it's about to happen on the 5th. And so you have this, not just in our time, you have this in the 1800s, you have it in the 1700s, you have it in the 1600s, you have it century after century, people say, ah, this is the date, and they always turn out to be wrong. Uh, Sam quoted a passage from Mark. Let me quote one more passage from the book of Acts. Excellent. This is after Jesus rises from the dead and they ask, when are, you, when, when are the end times coming? When are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Watch what Jesus said. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They've got Jesus in front of them, the risen Jesus. And they ask him, we want to know, give us the date. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Exactly. Jesus, who is, our, who is our authority, says, it's not for you to know. And that's why it's so strange to see so many Christians say, oh, I know, I know, when Jesus said, it's not for us to know. And this is one Jesus talking to the apostles. Yep. The, it's not for the apostles to know. And yet you'll find this Christian down the street who says, I know, I, I, I've been given this revelation. By the way, given the reference, you said Acts, but it's Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. Yes. Acts 1, 6 to 7. Write that down, folks. Acts 1, 6 to 7. Thank mm -hmm. you. So, yes, we'd have a problem with uh, anyone claiming to know the exact date or time of the rapture of uh, any of the end time events. Yeah. All Do right, have we have more call? callers back there? Or. Okay, cool. All right, so we, we got, got some free time? Callers. Yes. What do you want to. Uh, um, don't forget, Dave, that earlier you said you're going to give some reasons why you think God could have actually fulfilled the words of Muhammad mm -hmm. to give convincing proof to Muslims to show he's a false prophet by using his own words against him. Mm -hmm. We gave some reasons why we think that Allah would kill Muhammad. Now, again, let's preface that. I don't believe Allah the Quran is a true God. I do believe that our sovereign God can take the words of a false prophet and use those words against him, killing him exactly the way he said he'd be killed in order to give convincing proof to Muslims he's a fraud. Mm -hmm. But what... What other reason would we have to assume that the true God would kill Muhammad or allow Muhammad to die in the way he said he'd die if he's a false prophet? Because you were alluding to it earlier. A different Jesus, a different gospel. Maybe you want to elaborate on that. Uh, well, there's no question. Uh, when you open the, 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 the New Testament, the, the gospel, which the Quran affirms that the Christians have the gospel. When we open this book... It doesn't line up with Islam, the core of the Christian gospel. We have the book of Acts. So we have Jesus' original followers. He dies. He rises from the dead. He commissions them to go and preach the gospel to all nations, and they go out and do it. He's not like the apostles we hear about according to Islam, where we're told Jesus uh, preached the gospel, and then Allah tricked everyone into thinking Jesus died on the cross when he really didn't, and then the apostles... They came up with this corrupt gospel, and then the apostle came along. The apostle Paul came along, and the gospel, and the, the apostles just crumbled, and they couldn't stand against them, and the entire thing fell apart. That's not what you see when you go back to what really happened, and that's not what we would expect from God. I mean, think about it. On the, according to the Muslim version, Allah sends Jesus, born of a virgin, lives the most miraculous life in history. Then Allah tricks everyone into thinking Jesus died on the cross when he really didn't. And the apostles go out telling people Jesus died on the cross for their sins because Allah tricked them into believing Jesus died. And then the apostle Paul comes on, along and helps Allah corrupt the message. Because remember, the part about Jesus dying was due to Allah. Allah corrupted that part of the gospel. And then the apostle Paul comes along, corrupts the rest. Then the apostles go out spreading this corrupt version of Christianity, which is Christianity as we know it today. You tell me that, you're telling me, one, God is a failure, a miserable failure. He wanted to deliver a revelation and just couldn't do it. People kept him from doing it. So you are blaspheming God. You're also blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ because 
Jesus didn't say he's just a prophet. Jesus didn't say he's just a virgin-born, miracle-working prophet. The miracles were confirmation of his identity, proof of who he was, proof that he has God's stamp of approval. And Jesus over and over again made claims that no mere human being could claim without being a deceiver. So here's what you have. The apostles, the real followers of Jesus Christ, went out and preached a message. When you look in the book of Acts, you see that their message centered around three things. One, uh, who Jesus was. You had to accept Jesus as Lord. Two, Jesus died on the cross for sins. And three, he rose from the dead. That's the core of the Christian gospel. And I find it very strange, as kind of a side note, that Muslims even use the term gospel. Because the way Muslims use it doesn't make any sense. The term, the term gospel means something. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the term gospel that's used during the first century and in Greek even before the, the New Testament time, it had a particular meaning. It meant something. It referred to in, uh, in a Jewish context, when they heard the Greek word, when they heard the Greek word, euangelion, it meant something. Uh, that's the word for gospel. Uh, when they heard that, it referred in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah to God returning to be enthroned in Israel, God returning Israel from captivity and God returning to his throne uh, in Israel to reign over the Jews. That's what it meant in a Roman context. So in the Roman, in the Roman world, uh, the, the word for gospel referred to a new king, a new king had been enthroned and this king was going to bring lasting peace. So when we hear the gospel, this is called the gospel because it's good news, which for Jews had to do with God, God returning his people from captivity and sitting down on the throne. And in a Greek or Roman context, it referred to a new king taking over the empire and bringing a lasting peace. So from a Christian point of view, the use of the term gospel makes perfect sense. You have Jesus Christ who is bringing people out of captivity, sitting on the throne of David, and who is, uh, who is the new king who's going to bring peace because he's the prince of peace. The word gospel makes perfect sense. But Muslims say, yes, Jesus brought the gospel. But there's nothing in Islam that fits that with the meaning of the term gospel. There's nothing in Islam that Jesus did that fits. Jesus came, God corrupted the message, the apostles failed miserably, the message is corrupted, everyone gets a bunch of deception and nonsense. How is that good news? How is that victory? How is that a new king on the throne? What's that got to do with anything? So we know, on the one hand, you can tell just from the meaning of the term gospel that Muslims use that they're not preaching the gospel. They're not preaching a gospel of any kind. It was failure upon failure upon failure, according to Islam. So that doesn't fit. But also you have uh, the core of the gospel that was preached by Jesus followers who, according to the Quran, would be victorious until the day of resurrection. Uh, these men went out and they preached a message that centered around three things, Jesus' sacrificial death for sins, his resurrection from the dead, his divine nature. That was the core of the Christian gospel. Now, Sam, CL, yes. Islam agrees with Christianity on a number of things, does it not? Sure. Oh, yes. Don't Muslims agree with us that Jesus was born of a virgin? Yep. Yes. Don't Muslims agree with us that Jesus lived the most miraculous life in history? Exactly. Yes. Don't Muslims agree with us that Jesus had a miraculous end to his earthly existence here? Yep. Yes. Don't Muslims agree with us that Jesus is the Messiah? Yes. Don't Muslims agree with us about all these things? Obviously, they're going to agree with us. They're, on, they're going, to, don't, going to be on the same page when it comes to Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity, are they not? Well, that's what we'd expect because of the similarities. But no, unfortunately, that's not the case. That's not what happened at all. Okay. Nope. Uh, because the Quran actually says that we are disbelievers who are saying that Allah is the Messiah, the Son of Mary. That's number one. Which in Islamic terminology, that means if you affirm that Jesus is divine, you're a disbeliever. That's number one. Chapter 9 of the Quran, Surah Al-Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 30. By the way, those references, chapter 5, verse 17, Surah Al-Maidah, chapter 5, verse 17, the same chapter 5, verse 72. In those two places, we are specifically told that they are disbelievers who say that Allah is the Messiah, the Son of Mary. In other words, whoever says that Jesus is divine, that he's God in the flesh, is a disbeliever. He is not to be accepted or recognized as a true believer, as a fellow believer. 
Chapter 9, verse 30 is quite interesting. And let me know when I have to stop because if we have callers. We, 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 we do have some callers on okay. the line. But I, I, just, I just wanted to ask very quickly, <laughs> even though the Quran says that we're disbelievers because we believe in the gospel. Exactly. We, believe, we actually believe in the gospel that was proclaimed by Jesus' followers. Uh, surely the Quran claims that we're okay because this, that we're still good people. No, that's where chapter 9, verse 30 comes in. That verse was composed in the context of inciting Muslims to do offensive jihad to spread the rule of Islam geographically and politically through military expeditions until Jews and Christians accepted the rule of Islam and paid jizya, a sum of money, so that they would feel subdued, humiliated, disgraced, and debased. So no, we're not okay, according well, hold, to chapter hold 9. On, hold, on, hold on, hold on, Okay, Muslims are commanded to fight us, but it's still, we're, we're, still, we're still God's people, aren't we? Aren't no. we all children of God? What? Chapter 5, verse 18 says, Jews and Christians are not the children of God. Chapter 5, verse 18, they're not his beloved. Chapter 98, verse 6 says, of the Quran, by the way. Chapter 98, verse 6 says that we are the worst of creatures. Hold on, hold on. Okay, we'll, we'll have to look at that again tomorrow when right. we talk about uh, some taqiyya going on in Western Islam, which seems to indicate that uh, everyone's okay with Allah and everyone's okay. I'm okay. No You're matter okay, what you all believe, okay. we're all fine yeah. uh, with Islam. Sing um, all right, we have some more callers. Who do we have on the line? George, George, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Welcome to hey, Jesus George, how are you? George. Good, thank you. I have two quick questions. Okay. Uh, my first question is, how do Muslims uh, justify that there is an unforgivable sin in Islam, which is uh, shirk, when Muhammad himself has committed that sin? Yeah. And my second quest question is, if you can elaborate on this, um, Muslims want to convert Christians to Islam. If Christians do convert to Islam, how are they forgiven when they have committed uh, the sin shirk? Yeah, yeah. And I'll take the answer on the air. Thank okay. you. All right, uh, David, before I comment, do any of you brothers want to comment on that? Do you see what he's saying? By the way, yeah. if George is still on the air, you said Muhammad committed shirk. I'm assuming you're mm -hmm. speaking in respect to the satanic verses? Yeah. I, I believe he's speaking about that. The satanic verses, because he said he'd take it on the air or off the air? What's that? Because uh, he said the questions. Because he said, how do Muslims justify Muhammad committing shirk when the Quran says that sin won't be forgiven? Yeah, I don't answer. know which incident he's referring to. Do you guys know? I, I, I have to assume it has to be about the, um, the satanic verses. Okay. And well, so that he, he, uh, he made Satan a partner with Allah. Okay, if that's what he's referring to, do you, you guys want to comment on that? How could he be forgiven after claiming to be a prophet Knowing that Allah is one, after saying that shirk is unforgivable, and then he goes ahead and makes Satan a partner with Allah. Uh, one thing, it, it wasn't just shirk, it was shirk al-akbar. Yeah, it was major shirk. The major shirk, because that's the, sh the shirk that's not forgiven. Because there are two shirk. There's shirk al-akbar and shirk al-asgar. The smaller shirk, the minor shirk, the one does, like say you're making salah, and you're worried about people looking at you. That's right. That's a minor thing that... Allah may forgive you, he may not, but shirk al-akbar. No, you cannot be forgiven for this. The Quran and Sunnah teach plainly that when you commit the sin, you become a polytheist, you will enter the hellfire for eternity. So he committed major shirk. So then how could he be forgiven and how could he be allowed entrance into paradise? Now, wouldn't most Muslims today say what this is referring to is that if you die in the sin without repenting? Yes. Now, that's what most Muslims say. However, that's not qualified in the Quran. Yeah, I know. In the Quran, nowhere does it say that if you continue in shirk knowingly mm -hmm. uh, and you repent before you die, then you'll be forgiven. No. The Quran actually says, do not set up rivals when you know. Do not set up partners with Allah when you know. Mm -hmm. Muhammad knew. Muhammad clearly knew that if he set up partners with Allah, knowing that Allah is one, and this is an unforgivable sin, then all his deeds would be in vain and he'd be condemned. Whether he repented before that or not, it's irrelevant. Because the condition is, once you know, do not set up rivals. Mm -hmm. Now, that leads to the second question uh, concerning those who so, suppose they are committing shirk. For example, David and I, in the eyes of Muslims, are mushrikun. We're the ones who commit shirk because we believe that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say I become a Muslim. How can I be a Muslim if I've committed shirk and that's unforgivable? Well, th th that's where ignorance comes into play and it's a factor according mm -hmm. to Muslim scholars. Muslim scholars say that if a person's committing shirk in ignorance, mm -hmm. not knowing the gravity of shirk, Allah will show him mercy. After all, all of Muhammad's companions were mushrikun. Mm -hmm. 
All of the companions of Muhammad worshipped gods and goddesses. Obviously, Allah forgave them according to the Quran. Mm -hmm. So the condition is, do not set up partners with Allah once you know. Mm -hmm. That applies to Muhammad. Mm -hmm. He knew, and because he knew, he was guilty and therefore blameworthy, and his repentance would not be accepted, which further confirms our suspicion, the cold case file. Who murdered Muhammad? So Dave, who murdered him? Uh, if I were a Muslim and I were reading these sources, I'd have to say Allah did it. Yes. If I were a Muslim, I'd have to say Allah. And to confirm what I just said, that Muhammad, once he knew Allah's one, if he were to associate partners with Allah, he stands condemned and blameworthy. Chapter 39, verse 65 of the Quran. Chapter 39, verse 65, directed to Muhammad. And indeed, it has been revealed to you, O Muhammad. Now, Muhammad is in parentheses, not part of the Arabic text, but it's implied. As it was to those before you. If you join others in worship of Allah, surely your deeds will be in vain, and you will certainly be among the losers. Mm. So it was revealed to him, supposedly, and yet he went off and committed shirk anyway. And the devil made me do it. Exactly. <laughs> That's his excuse. Exactly what he said. The devil. He only had two excuses. The devil made me do it, and the Jews did it. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> the devil made me do it, and oh, I'm having this magic spell. The Jews did it. Well. Well, so I mean, this is odd because of Muhammad, who is the last prophet, he's the example for the, all of humanity. He's getting tricked by the devil. <laughs> he's got magic spells yeah. put on him. You know, he's imagining he's you know having relations with his wife, wives mm -hmm. when he's not. He thinks um, he's possessed. He's possessed. He's he tries suicidal. to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. I mean. He's got a lot of problems. No, but yeah. man, he's, he's got more problems than anyone I know of, and yeah. he's the greatest. No, messenger. he's perfect. He's holy. He's guarded. He's protected. What are you guys talking? Mm -hmm. well, if this is protection, then I don't want to know what not being protected <laughs> looks like, right? <laughs> Made some scary stuff. Uh, all right, we have to take our final break. I know we've got some other callers on the line, but we'll go to our our final break, and we'll get right back to our callers here on Jesus or Muhammad. See you in a moment. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. We've seen a lot so far. We've seen uh, that according to Muhammad, if he's a false prophet, he's going to die by having his aorta cut. And we saw that according to Muslim sources, Muhammad died complaining that he was feeling his aorta being cut. We've seen satanic verses. We've seen Muhammad uh, being oppressed. We've seen Muhammad uh, thinking that he's demon-possessed. Or insane. We've seen Muhammad uh, being a victim of black magic. We've seen all kinds of things. Muhammad becoming suicidal. Uh, and this is the man Muslims point to us, uh, point to us to tell us that uh, this is the guy you have to believe in uh, if you want to enter paradise and get your 72 virgins. Uh, this is the guy you have to believe in. Um, very, very strange. We have some other callers. Let's go ahead and take some calls. Uh, I think we have Andy on the line. Hello? Andy? Yes, hi. 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 Hey. Am I on the air? Yes. Hi, how are you, Sam? How are you, David? How are you, I'm doing? from Illinois. I called yesterday. I'm a Christian. Mm. Praise the Lord. Um, I have a question for your guest. Okay. Um, I, I, like I said yesterday, I've talked to a um, few Muslims at work yesterday, and I have received um, answers that they do believe in other prophets. Now, my question would be, if they do believe in biblical prophets, um, is there any possibility that they, they would know what the prophets say about the, the real God if they don't read the Bible? That's my mm. first question. Second question would be, um, <clears throat> I also believe that they, they know exactly what Jesus did and what kind of miracles they, he performed. Um, here on earth, but even though they do realize that they, he was uh, a virgin, um, a, a virgin born, and performed many miracles, why do they, why do they still uh, treat Muhammad higher than Jesus? That's my second question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, your first question about yes, Muslims are told that a part of their creed, their aqidah that they have to believe in all of the previous prophets who came before Muhammad. Muhammad, he's simply the last prophet in a succession of prophets. He's the capstone. Um, 
Yes, Muslims believe in these other prophets. They believe in many of the biblical prophets, but they don't know a whole lot of biblical information about these prophets because they're not to they don't read the Bible, or at least they're not supposed to read the Bible. Actually, Muhammad saw one of his companions, I believe it was Omar, it was Omar. reading the uh, 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 literature, the Torah from the Jews, and he admonished him for doing this. So this is something that's told to you in the, in the mosque, that you're not supposed to read the Bible. This is corrupt material. So they don't, they don't know the biblical narrations and stories about these prophets. They don't know all the information about these prophets, and they definitely don't know what these prophets taught about Yahweh, Almighty God. Now, now uh, but before you continue, we're going to let you continue. Sam, uh, wh why would Muhammad not want his followers reading the Torah and the Gospel? Uh, very simple. The Torah and the Gospel, as it existed in the time of Muhammad, which he mistakenly confirmed to be the uncorrupt revelations of God. And I think, by the grace of God, we need to revisit that issue. Did mm -hmm. Muhammad believe our scriptures are the uncorrupt Word of God? Clearly expose him, not just as a false prophet, but as Antichrist. Don't forget, Dave and CL, what I quoted earlier. Mm -hmm. First John chapter 2, verses 22 to 23, says that this is how you know an Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Muhammad said, Allah is not a father. Jesus is not a son. Simple as that. And then when you went to uh, the satanic verses, I don't know if you mentioned, David, and I think you probably did in passing. We didn't have time to elaborate. What you call the Deuteronomy deductions. Mm -hmm. uh, God tells Moses that this is how you know a false prophet. If he says something that did not come from God, he's a false prophet. Don't be afraid. Great of him. He is to be put to death. He is to die. Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 to 22. Notice what he says to Moses. If a prophet says something that's not from God, from Yahweh, he is a false prophet. He has spoken presumptuously. He is to be put to death. Well, according to the satanic verses, did not Muhammad admit these verses which he ascribed to God or Allah were actually from Satan so that he wrongly attributed them to God? Yes. So according to the Quran, Muhammad spoke in the name of someone who wasn't God, a false God, and attributed it to the true God. Therefore, he stands condemned. So mm -hmm. one, one, one second. Let me, let me add one. So you have... Moses, according to Moses, Muhammad is a false prophet. Yes. And is it not true that uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, which if Muslims go and read the Gospel that they're told is the Word of God, they'd find Jesus saying, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the yes, Pharisees exactly. and the teachers point. of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he explains to them how their righteousness must uh, must be greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees. And one of the ways is loving your enemies. And he says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. So hold on. According to Moses, Muhammad is a false prophet. Here Jesus says, unless your love is greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees, unless you love your enemies... Pray for them. You're not entering the kingdom of heaven. Think about how, um, how that, a Muslim would respond to that when he opens the Quran and sees that according to Muhammad, Surah 332, Allah has no love for the unbelievers. Allah doesn't love your enemies. Allah has no love for your enemies. That's why in Islam you can kill them. God does not love them. So according to Moses, who gives very clear, specific criteria, these are the things that a false prophet will do, and Muhammad does exactly those things. And here Jesus says, if you don't do these things, if, if, if your love isn't greater than this, you're not entering paradise. Therefore, Muhammad isn't even going to heaven, let alone can he be a prophet. Exactly. And then Paul lays down the criteria for, uh, for a false prophet. Anyone who speaks another gospel, a Other gospel Jesus, yeah. that does not consist of Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity, may he be eternally condemned. Exactly. And so, and so if Muslims were to open up the Bible, which, ironically, the Quran says is the word of God, if Muslims were to open up these books, they'd see that according to Moses, according to Jesus, according to Paul, Muhammad is a false prophet, and then they'd have a problem. Then they'd have a massive problem mm -hmm. on their hands. But there was a second part to that question, yes. brother, about Jesus. Yes, uh, he had a second question where he said, um, if, if Muslims know about Jesus and all his miracles, his virgin birth, how can they put Muhammad above yeah. Jesus? How can they? That's a good question. Well, well, number one, this my answer relates to the first answer. Do they really know about Jesus and his miracles? Yes, I mean, the Quran talks about certain miracles he spoke 
when he was born to defend his mother. He, he sculpted a, uh, a bird of clay and blew into it. But it doesn't really go into the details that you see in the Bible account about all the miracles he did, the loving kindness that he showed to the people, healing the blind, healing the, the lame and the sick. It doesn't go into this detail. But the reason why Muslims have to put Muhammad above Jesus, even though if you put their biographies side by side and Jesus clearly wins out, is because you have to obey Muhammad, whatever Muhammad says, what Muhammad says goes. And I'll, I'll point you to a uh, verse in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nisa, 65, it says, But no, they can have no faith until they make you, O Muhammad, judge in all their disputes between them, and find in their souls no resistance against their thy decision, but accept them with full conviction. So you see in this verse, this supposed to be revelation from Allah, that Allah makes Muhammad the binding judge about what's faith and what's not faith. You know what's amazing about that, Ziel? We are told often by Muslims, Islam is submission or surrender. Mm. And that you are su submit yourself to the will of the one true God, Allah. A true Muslim is one who desires and seeks inwardly to submit fully to the prescriptive will, the revealed will of Allah, right? This is correct. But 465 told you that Islam is not just the submission to the one God, but also to his messenger Muhammad. Mm. Did you see the last part of the verse? Mm. It says that they will not be true believers, basically, unless they have no aversion to your decision inwardly. That means even inwardly, they must accept perfectly your decision. Yeah. They can't just feign it externally and say, okay, Muhammad, but inside complain. Inwardly, their disposition has to be, I submit, and they fully submit to you with perfect submission. Why in the world is Allah having his followers fully submit to Muhammad as opposed to him? Mm. Let's say, well, by submitting to Muhammad, you're submitting to Allah. Well, again, my problem with that assertion, and I don't want to drag the point. We have another caller, I believe. My problem with that assertion is that you don't find this language used for any other prophet or messenger. Even the, sh the shahadatain, the confession. There's no God, but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Go back and read the entire Old Testament. Read the entire New Testament. You'll never find any prophet saying... You must fully submit to me. Do you know why? Because prophets are not impeccable, meaning they can make mistakes. Therefore, it's not wise for anyone to fully submit to a prophet. The only time you submit to a prophet is when he's speaking the words of God. You are to fully submit to the words of God that the prophet speaks and then hold that prophet accountable to whether he submits to those words or not. But you are not to fully submit to a prophet because they're prone to making mistakes. The only exception is Jesus Christ. In fact, CL, what is the creed of Judaism? Deuteronomy 6, 4, right? Where it says, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Notice what it does not go on to say. And Moses is his prophet. You do not find any creed in the Bible where God and a creature are exalted and mentioned together and conjoined as objects of saving faith. You find that with Jesus because according to the New Testament, Jesus is no creature. Mm -hmm. So you must love, worship, and fully submit to Jesus, the divine Son, as you do the Father and the Spirit. But in Trinitarianism, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not a creature. But you Muslims are telling me Muhammad is a creature. Why then must you confess him in order to be a Muslim to be saved? And why must you fully submit to him in the same way you fully submit to Allah? When no other creature who is a messenger demanded that kind of respect, reverence, and submission. Mm -hmm. All right. Sure. Thank you, brothers. And uh, let's go to, I think this will be the last call we have time for tonight. I think we have David on the line. But you're here, Dave. Uh, 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 am I on the line? Is this David? Yes, it is. I love your name. It's awesome. <laughs> well, uh, hey, Dave and Sam, I am absolutely honored to be talking to you guys. I've been watching every video you guys have made, all your debates. You're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, brother. That's all glory to Jesus. Yeah, I, I, Sam, you got a little more edge, I think, than a little more edgy than Dave, but uh, you're doing a great job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> problem is, is because I'm, I've gotten bigger over time, and I'm taking out my frustration on the camera and the viewers. <laughs> I, I can't wait for you to have a full English channel 24/7. That's, that's Jesus. Great. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, here's a question that I've, I've been wondering about, though, is that uh, why was it important for Muhammad to deny that Christ was crucified and died? Couldn't he have? said, okay, I agree, he was crucified and he did die, but then he was raised up by, by God, yeah. but he's still just a man. Yeah. There must be a key there where he can't admit that it was, the crucifixion actually occurred. 
-hmm. What do you think, Dave? Uh, yeah, I get. So, the, so the question is, why would Muhammad? He's granting all kinds of other things. He's granting virgin birth. He's granting miracles. He's granting that right. Jesus is the Messiah. He's granted so much that obviously exalts right. Jesus. Why deny this? Uh, why deny Jesus? Uh, death by crucifixion. And I think there are two possible ways um, you can go here. One, if you look at it from a spiritual aspect, if Muhammad truly is being influenced by demonic forces, so in other words, Christians could hold this view because we believe in demonic forces. We believe that false prophets can be guided by demonic forces. And that's the, the most important way that, uh, that demonic forces uh, mislead people is by tampering with the gospel. And so if we look at the book of Acts, we find that the three most important facts, the core of the gospel, again, Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity, not the virgin birth, not that Jesus is the Messiah, death, resurrection, and deity, this is the core. So if you're going to tamper with something, you tamper with that core, the, the, the most important facts of the gospel, which is why um, it's, 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 it's not surprising that if someone comes along like Muhammad, who's a false prophet, he can say, yes, I agree with you Christians on all these things. I agree with you on pretty much everything except these three things, which just happen to be the core of the Christian gospel. So from a Christian perspective, from a Christian perspective, we, would, we, we could say that it's not surprising at all that demonic forces would attack that part, the core of the Christian gospel, more than anything else. But if we're just looking at from, let's say, an, an, an atheist perspective, here's what I would say if I were an atheist about this. I would say... Uh, during the, Roman Empire, during the Roman Empire, the Roman emperor eventually uh, cast the heretics, the heretical, the heretical Christian groups, the ones who had deviated from the clear teachings of the New Testament, cast them out of the Roman Empire. Many of these uh, heretical Christians went to the Middle East and settled there, outside of the Roman Empire. And apparently many of the Christians that Muhammad would have met um, were, for instance, Gnostics or something like that, which was a version of Christianity that had been influenced by uh, Greek Neoplatonism, uh, the pl philosophy that uh, descended from Plato. Um, and some of these teachings, some of these teachings are very interesting. Uh, some of the Gnostics and the, Dos and the Docetists, some of these groups that were around uh, for the, the centuries leading up to the time of Muhammad, had some interesting teachings. One of them, interestingly, was that all matter is evil. Now, we know that from a biblical perspective, God created everything and everything is good. The world is good. It cannot be evil. But this group believed that when God created matter, it wasn't the true God. It was some lower God and that this world is evil. So this matter is evil. Human bodies are evil. This is what these, these groups were teaching. The question arose, the question arose, well, how could Jesus, because they believed in the deity of Christ, interestingly, how could Jesus have had a human body? Well, they, they reasoned Jesus couldn't have a human body. He couldn't have physical flesh because flesh is evil. Jesus is too wonderful for that. He couldn't, he couldn't be part of evil creation. Well, if Jesus could not be part of this creation, just, so, just if those of you who aren't following right now, I'm not talking about what Christians believe. We believe Jesus had a body. I'm talking about certain groups that denied this, um, that didn't line up with the teachings of the Bible. These heretical Christian groups actually maintain Jesus didn't have a physical body because all matter is evil. So Jesus is walking around, but he's not really walking around. It's just an illusion. Well, the question then became, well, how did Jesus die on the cross? And these groups started having to explain it by saying it was just an illusion. Jesus didn't really die on the cross. Some of them even started maintaining someone else was actually crucified when uh, everyone else thought that Jesus was being crucified. So you actually have stories similar to the ones we have in the Quran being circulated in the centuries leading up to Muhammad. They have no basis in history. The basis is actually Greek pagan philosophy, which influenced them into thinking Jesus could not have been an actual human being. And isn't it amazing that Muslims uh, accuse us of being influenced by paganism when we look to the actual teachings of Muhammad and we find that's where Muhammad got a lot of these stories from. We're from pagan philosophy and it's not surprising when you have the black stone and circling the Kaaba and all these practices that were pagan practices shouldn't be surprising at all that some of the stories even that Muhammad accepted about Christianity would be influenced by paganism well that's all the time we have we have to end our show and so we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, wrap things up and just as you as you go on your way think about how Muhammad is so very different from the Lord Jesus Christ 
thing about Muhammad, my 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 wife, we 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 have our laptops open so that we can uh, so that we can uh, uh, look up passages from the Quran and the Bible uh, easily instead of flipping through pages. But uh, while my uh, while I was here, my wife sent me an email commenting on Muhammad. How did Muhammad trust this woman who brings him a poison sheep when he had just killed her family? I mean, you'd have to not be very intelligent to trust a woman who here here I've got you just killed my entire family. Here's a sheep, and oh okay, let me have a bite. Uh, you'd have to, you'd have to, there has to be something wrong with you there to trust a woman whose family has just been slaughtered by your men and to trust, uh, this, this meal that's being brought to you. Um, and my wife pointed out that if Muhammad had been literate, if Muhammad had been able to read, maybe it, he would have read the Iliad where the Greeks brought the Trojan horse, uh, in order to conquer the Trojans. They build a horse and they hide inside it. They bring, here's our gift. We brought you this, this lovely horse. And of course that horse was, uh, contained the soldiers that were going to overthrow their city. If Muhammad had just, uh, had just been able to read, maybe he would be familiar with that. And maybe he would have understood you need to beware of people who are bringing you gifts if they're at war with you. Um, so illiteracy strikes again. And maybe, my wife said, maybe uh, Muhammad's teachings can be put to some good use in the world today in the campaign for literacy. Don't die like Muhammad. Learn to read and you'll know these things. Uh, and finally, again, just compare this with the teachings of Jesus. Muhammad said, God will never allow you to poison and kill me. And then Muhammad, from that poison that he consumed, died. And then you have the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes and says, all of you who think that I'm not going to die, you need to know that I am going to die because it's part of God's plan. But just to show you that it is God's plan, I'm going to rise from the dead. And then he rose in perfect fulfillment of his teachings. And Muhammad died totally contradicting his own teachings, saying that he would never die this uh, horrible, disgraceful death. My friends, how can you believe in Muhammad and reject the true Lord Jesus Christ when Jesus so obviously has God's stamp of approval? I'll leave you with that. We'll be back tomorrow night at 8 o'clock to talk about some tekiyah or deception that's going on here in the West. We'll see you then. Until then, God bless you.